One of the things I try to do when a year is coming to an end, a new year is approaching, is to seek God about what He wants us to focus on in the coming year as a church. In 2016, the emphasis was on the basics, and we kicked the year off by having a series called Basic Training. It's been a year ago. Some of you might not recall that series, but I promise you, the month of January, we had a series called Basic Training. We looked at things like fellowship and prayer and evangelism and discipleship, the Bible, all things that are basic or fundamental to the Christian life. And throughout 2016, we gave our time and we gave our attention to developing in these areas of life. 2017, we're going to be directing our time and attention to the process of building. And if you think about it, that's a natural progression. Once the basic foundation has been set, the most natural step would be to what? Begin to build on that foundation. And I believe that that is what God wants to do this year. God wants to build His church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is going to build this church in 2017. Just like he's done every year since the first century. So Jesus is going to build his church in 2017. But here's the question we must answer. Are we going to do the things necessary for Jesus to build this local church fellowship in 2017? The question is not whether or not Jesus is going to build his church. That's what Jesus does. The question is whether or not we're going to be a people that cooperates with God and allows him to build this local church church fellowship. Today I'm starting a three-week series called This Is What We Do. Over the next three weeks, I'm going to be sharing with you three things that we must do if we're going to be a church that God builds in 2017. And up front, I want to say that this series is not a rebuke. This series is a reminder. In no way am I suggesting that we're not doing these things as a church already. I'm simply reminding us that these are the things that must always be on our list of things to do as a church. For example, this is what we do. We welcome without judgment. Again, I'm not saying that we don't do that already as a church. I'm simply saying that we must always keep this up front as a church. We welcome without judgment. Judgment. Now, I want to stop and I want to define a couple of words before we move forward because I want us to all be on the same page. What do we mean by welcome? Well, we mean gladly receiving someone with acceptance and communicating that to them. We're glad you're here. Now, it isn't just simply saying we're glad you're here, but it's actually showing them also. That we're, that we're glad that they're here. So when we say we want to be a church that welcomes, this is what we mean. We receive them, accept them, and we communicate that to them. What do we mean by judgment? Well, we mean having a bad opinion of another person based on too high of an opinion of oneself. It's looking down and another person that's worse in order to make us look better. So we're going to welcome people without having a bad opinion of them based on, a, on too high of an opinion of ourselves. Whereas we're looking it down on them as worse in order to make us look better. That's the kind of church that God wants us to be. He wants us to be a church that welcomes without judgment. In a few moments, we're going to look at a story in Luke 7 where Jesus welcomes someone without judgment. Before we get to that story, though, we need to look back. We need to see what Jesus had been teaching. In Luke chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus says to those that he's teaching, he says, do not judge, and you will not be judged. Now, please don't hear what Jesus is not saying. 
Jesus is not saying that we should never make a judgment about someone. Jesus is not forbidding the process of forming an opinion about someone by discerning and comparing. Now, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, Jesus said not to judge. Well, that's a misinterpretation of Scripture. Because right after Jesus says, do not judge, if you go on down to what he begins to talk about, he begins to talk about a tree and its fruit. Now, when you look at a tree... And you say, boy, that's an apple tree. Are you forming a judgment? Yeah. You are. You're discerning. You're comparing. You're saying, that's an apple tree and not, a, not an orange tree because it has apples and not oranges. You're discerning. You're comparing. So please do not hear what Jesus is not saying. Jesus in no way is saying that we should never form an opinion about someone by discerning and comparing. That's not what he's saying. Jesus said not to judge. What Jesus is forbidding is making ourselves look better by, here's the key word, condemning someone as worse than us. Jesus says, do not judge and you will not be judged. And then Jesus elaborates on what he just said. He says, do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Jesus goes on to say in verse 38, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured in your lap. Now, so often we use this simply in the context of giving money. But if you look at it in the context of what Jesus is teaching, he, just, he was just talking about judgment. And so Jesus says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured in your lap. For the, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so in this context, Jesus is saying the measure of judgment that we use towards someone is the measure of judgment that God uses toward us. James reveals this truth when he writes in James 2.13. Listen to this. James says, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. In other words, the measure you use, if you judge someone without mercy, guess what? That's what's going to be measured to you. That's what Jesus is teaching. So whatever measure, measurement we use, it will be measured to us. So Jesus is not saying that we should not judge. He's merely saying that we should be careful how we judge. There's a big difference. We need to be careful not to be hypocr hypocritical in our judgment of others. Before we try to remove the speck from someone else's eye, we need to first take out the plank out of our own eye. Only then will we be able to form an, a, a proper opinion about someone else. So this is one of the things that Jesus has been teaching leading up to Luke chapter 7. Then we come to Luke chapter 7. And Jesus says in Luke 7, 30, and the, Luke writes in Luke 7, 36, it says, now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. Now, the Pharisees, they were a religious, political uh, group or party, numbering about 6,000 who distinguished themselves from others by their strict observance of the written and oral law. They believed the way to God was by obeying the law. And so their emphasis was solely on the outward works of man in relation to God. If you do all these things, then you'll be right with God. That was their emphasis. They were very strict when it came to the, the law. And Jesus, he, he had frequent, frequent run-ins with the Pharisees because of this legalistic way of thinking. In Matthew 23 alone, okay, this is just one chapter. In Matthew 23 alone, we find Jesus calling the Pharisees hypocrites, blind guides, whitewashed tombs, and snakes. One chapter. So that kind of gives you an idea of the run-ins that Jesus had with the Pharisees because of their legalistic way of thinking. I want you to keep that in mind as we go back to the story. Okay, so Jesus calls these guys snakes. 
He calls them whitewashed tombs. He, call, he calls them blind guides. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. Why? Why did this Pharisee invite Jesus to have dinner with him after Jesus had called him all these things? I mean, how many of you? Somebody looked at you and said, you're a snake. You're a hypocrite. You're a blind guy. How many would say, hey, we'll come over to dinner tonight? <laughs> but that's exactly what this Pharisee does. Why would he do that? Well, here's what, I, here's what I believe. I believe it's because he had yet to form an opinion about Jesus. He wasn't sure yet if Jesus was who he claimed to be. And so he wanted to invite him to dinner to get a little bit more information on this man called Jesus so that he could form an opinion about him. That's what I believe. And so he invites him to dinner. Luke continues in verse 36. So Jesus went. Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. Jesus accepts the Pharisee's invitation. What? Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites. He calls them snakes. So what's he doing accepting an invitation to go to dinner at this man's house? Well, he's doing what Jesus does. Here's the first truth I want to point out today. Jesus welcomes all who come to him. Now, Jesus, he had obvious disagreements with the Pharisees about their legalistic way of, of thinking, their, their legalistic system of, of religion and the heavy burden that such system placed on people. But Jesus still welcomed the Pharisees who came to him. And so Jesus, he goes to the Pharisees' house and he reclines at his table. Now, you've got to remember, things were a little bit different back in that day. They... Uh, I mean, the, the climate itself was very, very warm. You would say hot. Right? And so they didn't, they didn't have tables that were up on legs. They, they had tables that were low to the ground, and they would, this is how they would eat. I'm not going to stay down here. <laughs> but somebody might have to help me up. But they would eat like this. They would, they would, they would just eat because, remember, heat was. Right? So they would stay low to the ground. They would eat. And so Jesus is reclined at the table. That's what the Bible says. Verse 37 says, When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was, Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. Now Luke, he tells us several things about this woman. He tells us what kind of life she had lived. Luke says that she had lived a sinful life in that town. Literally, a life devoted to sin. This woman was the town prostitute and everybody knew it. So keep that in mind. Everybody in that town knew what this woman had been up to. She was a woman of the town. Not in a good sense, but in a bad sense. Luke also tells us that she's a party crasher. I love that. <laughs> Luke tells us that when she learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee house, she what? She comes to the house. Now, was she invited? Help me out. Was she invited? No. Did that stop her? No. She's a party crasher. Finally, we learn from Luke that this woman comes to the party with a gift. I mean, if you're going to crash a party, right? I mean, you might as well bring a gift. And that's what this woman does. Luke says that she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, alabaster was a stone that vases or jars were commonly made out of. This particular jar that this woman brought was filled with perfume. The particular fume was more than likely myrrh that had been imported from a foreign country, and so it was very expensive. Now, we're not told how this woman got this perfume. Maybe it was given to her as a gift from one of the men who had used her services. 
Maybe she had bought it for the money that she had earned from her sinful lifestyle. We don't know. All we know is that she brought it <coughs> to the house as a gift to Jesus. Verse 38. And as she stood behind Jesus, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. So this woman, she comes into the house uninvited. She finds a place to stand behind Jesus, and then she loses it. Luke says she begins weeping. Literally, she's sobbing. She's, she's wailing out loud. It, it is an uncontrollable cry. Have you, ever, have you ever wailed when you cried because you were so heartbroken, that you were so devastated by something that you, that you just couldn't stop crying and, and you were loud when you were doing it? Well, that was this woman. You say, well, why was this woman crying in such a way? What's, what's going on with this woman that she, would, that she would start weeping and wailing at the feet of Jesus? I'll tell you what's going on. She was broken over a sinful life. This kind of weeping and wailing was, was a sign of pain and grief over the time of life that she had lived. And so here she is. She's, she's soaking the feet of Jesus with her tears. So, so what does she do next? Verse 38 continues. Then she wiped them with her hair. Okay, so, so, so the tears are literally coming down like, like raindrops. I mean, that's the context. I mean, she's crying so much that, I mean, it's like a flood of tears coming from her eyes, landing on the feet of Jesus. His feet are getting wet, so what does she do? She looks around, she doesn't have a towel. So what does she do? She begins to use her long hair. She begins to, to dry the feet of Jesus with her hair. But she doesn't stop there. She, she begins to kiss the feet of Jesus. And the way, that, the way that Luke writes it it, 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 it implies that she didn't just kiss him once. She, she kissed him over and over and over. It was a sign of, of love. It was a sign of affection. And then she takes her expensive perfume. And she begins to pour it on Jesus' smelly feet. And we're going to see what this is all about in just a little while. But here's what I want you to notice. Jesus never pushes this woman away. Amen. <clears throat> Nowhere does Jesus say, you're standing a little too close to me. Mm -hmm. Nowhere does Jesus say, you know what? I, I, I really don't like you crying on my feet. And I certainly don't like you taking your hair and wiping your, your, my, my feet with your hair. Nowhere does, does Jesus ever say, get away from me. So let me ask you again, was this woman invited? Was she invited? No. Was she welcomed by Jesus? Yes. yes. Jesus welcomes all who come to him. Listen, church. Pharisees and prostitutes. Jesus welcomes all. All who come to him, this is what Jesus does, and this is what we should do. We don't look down on others as worse than us to make us look better, but instead we do what Philippians 2, 3 says, in humility we consider others better than ourselves. That's what we do. Now, not everyone was as welcoming to this woman as Jesus. Verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him, Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. Second truth I want to point out today is this. Religious hypocrites offer only selective welcome with judgment. Religious hypocrites offer only selective welcome with judgment. I mentioned 
mentioned earlier, the reason I believe this, this Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him was because he had yet to form an opinion about him. Wanted to gather a little bit more information about Jesus. He wasn't sure if Jesus was who he claimed to be, so he was going to question him a bit over dinner to try to come to some conclusion about him. Well, somewhere between dinner and dessert, this Pharisee forms an opinion about Jesus. And it's not because of anything Jesus says, but it's because of something Jesus does. As this Pharisee watches Jesus welcome this prostitute without judgment, this Pharisee forms a judgment about Jesus. Remember, he wasn't sure yet whether or not Jesus was a prophet. But after watching Jesus welcome such a woman, a prostitute, a sinner, this Pharisee is sure of one thing. He's sure that there's no way that Jesus is a prophet because if he were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman was touching him, that she is a sinner. And so this Pharisee is basically saying, you know what he's saying? I'm better than Jesus. That's what he's saying. I'm better than Jesus. I know more about this woman than Jesus does. Did he know more about this woman than Jesus did? No. But he thought he knew more about this woman than Jesus did. And so he forms a judgment not only about the woman. I mean, the moment the woman crashed the party, he already had judgment about her because everybody knew about this woman. So he already had a, an opinion about, about this woman. But once he began to see how Jesus welcomed her, it didn't take long for him to form an opinion about Jesus. And he said, there is no way this man's a prophet. In other words, I know more than Jesus. I'm better than Jesus. This guy goes from seeing himself as better than the woman. I mean, that's one thing, right? He shouldn't do that, but he already saw himself as better than the woman. He goes from seeing himself as better than the woman to now seeing himself as better than Jesus. Let me ask this. When we refuse to welcome those who Jesus welcomes, are we not guilty of seeing ourselves as better than Jesus? Jesus welcomes everybody. And if Jesus is willing to welcome all who come to him, and we are not willing to welcome all who come to us, what we are saying is, Jesus, we know more than you. We're better than you. That's what we're saying. <coughs> Sometimes we are more like the Pharisees than we care to admit. Jesus says, that's, that's not what I do, and that's not what my church is to do. My church are to welcome all without judgment. We're not to, we're not to be religious hypocrites where we welcome, welcome some with selective judgment. Right. <laughs> religious hypocrites offer selective welcome with judgment. That is what Pharisees do. So this Pharisee says to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Now, be careful what you say to yourself because Jesus hears it. You say, well, even if you don't say it out loud, Jesus hears it, right? He knows our thoughts. So there's never a moment where, where you know, God knows what you're thinking right now. Some of you are thinking, get on with it, preacher. <laughs> God knows that. Some of you are saying, you know what, I don't like this message. A little, close, a little too close to home. God knows that. He says to himself, I'm sure he probably thought, well, I, I'm not saying, his voice must carry, must have carried. <laughs> so he says to himself, I mean, if Jesus were a prophet, he'd know, he'd know who was touching him, that this woman is a sinner. Jesus here, hears him and he says, Simon, i got something to tell you. <laughs> Simon's like, tell me. So Jesus does what he so often did. You know what he did? He, he tells him a story to teach him the truth. Verses 41 and 42. Here's the story. Simon, listen up. Listen up. Here, here's a story for you. 
two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Now, a denarii was a coin. It was a coin worth about a day's worth of wages. Okay? And so one man owes a little over a month worth of wages. And the other man owes a little over a year's worth of wages. But the point is, they both owed something. They were indebted to this money lender. Jesus continues, neither of them had the money to pay him back. That's not a good thing, right? So what's this guy do? What's this money lender do? He's compassionate. He's merciful. And so he canceled the debts of both. He canceled the debts of both. The one who owed 50, the one who owed 500. And, and so, so he, says to, he says to Simon, now which one of them will love him more? And he wants Simon to answer the question. And Simon, he, he, he answers and he says, well, I, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. And Jesus says, you've judged correctly. Jesus then turns toward the woman. So he's looking at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. <coughs> he turns to the woman and he says to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. You know, it was common, it was just a common custom in that day. When you were a good host, when someone came into your house, you would offer water to wash their feet. Because they walked on dirty, dusty roads. And so to be a good host, to say that you were welcoming someone, you would offer them water so that they could clean their feet. If they didn't clean the feet for themselves, they would have a servant to, to come and clean the feet. You remember there's a story in the Bible in John where Jesus takes up the towel in the water basin and he cleans the feet of his disciples. And so he says to Simon, here I come into your house. You invite me here. You invite me to come to your place for dinner, yet you don't welcome me. And the way I know you don't welcome me is because you did not give any water for my feet. But what did she do? She wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. Again, common custom in that day. Thank God it's not that way today. But listen, in that culture, you greeted somebody with a holy kiss, man. Praise God, right, Terry? <laughs> now let's try this, Terry. <laughs> See, he's not welcoming me. <laughs> John's back there smiling. John. <laughs> Somebody came in? I mean, when you met somebody, you just you, you kiss them on one cheek, turn kiss them on the other. You know, you know, we do some, we do that some in our culture. We don't do it with strangers. You do, you're strange. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, I came in your house and you did not even, you didn't offer me a kiss. But this woman from the time I did her has not stopped kissing. He says, you did not put oil on my head. He says, he says, Simon, you didn't even take out the common olive oil. Olive oil was common in that culture. They used it for cooking and other things. And so it was very commonly found. He says, you didn't even take out the most common type of oil. And put it on my head. But she poured you. Yeah. She poured something that wasn't common. She, she poured something that was rare, something that was expensive on my feet. Why? For she loved.
But he who has been forgiven little loves little. This woman understood how much she had been forgiven by Jesus. And when she came into that house, she wasn't, get this, she wasn't assessing anyone but herself. This woman knew she was a sinner in need of being welcomed by Jesus. Here's the third truth I want to point out today is this. Forgiven sinners are broken over their own need for Christ's welcome. That was this woman. The reason this woman couldn't stop crying, couldn't stop loving on Jesus, is because she knew how much Jesus had done for her when he welcomed her and forgave her of her many sins. The reason this Pharisee couldn't stop judging, on the other hand, is because he was assessing everyone but himself, and therefore he failed to see how much he needed to be forgiven himself. The reality is that we become a judgmental Pharisee when we forget we are the sinful one. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you today, I am that sinful one. And I've got news for you. So are you. And when we fail to remember that we are that sinful woman, you know what we become? We become the judgmental heirs. When we forget how much we have been forgiven by God, we look down our nose at other people and we say, I'm better than them. Than, than. When the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. And so we become that judgmental Pharisee when we forget we are that sinful woman. The only way we welcome others without judgment is when we remember we are that sinful. Judgment begins with us. We must take the plank out of our own eye before we try to take the speck out of someone else's eye. Now as I bring this to a conclusion, I want to, I want to do so by sharing with you four things. I promise I'm going to move through these very quickly. Four things that Jesus means when he says don't judge. Because again, we, we don't understand it. And we need to put it in the proper context. Because the world, they throw that in our face all the time. Don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. Jesus said, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. Well, let's look at it in its proper context. Again, he's not permitting the process of forming an opinion about someone by discerning and comparing. That's not what he's doing. In Matthew 7, 6, Jesus tells us not to give dogs what is sacred and do not throw your pearls to the pig. Now, to obey that instruction, if we're going to obey that instruction, we have to make a judgment about who are dogs and pigs and who are not. Right? If Jesus says, don't cast your pearls to the pigs, then we've got to know who a, who a pig is and who isn't. So when we hire someone we're judging. When we fire someone, we're judging. Don't judge does not mean we're never to judge. Here's what it means. Don't judge means, number one, never judge broadly. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. You know where judgment begins? It begins with us. It begins in the house of God. We should, we should judge ourselves more than we should ever judge the world. You realize that? Judgment begins in the house of God. We're to look at ourselves. Before we ever start looking at the world, we begin to judge ourselves. We look and say, okay, what do I need to get right in my life? And so we should never judge broadly. They keep it very narrow, very close to home. Number two, never judge motives. Sometimes we're like, I know why they did so-and-so, or I know why they didn't do so-and-so. Let me ask you something. Do you know the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl? No. Do I? No. Does Jesus? Absolutely. You know, there's only one person who can accurately judge the motives of anyone, and that is God himself. So when we say, well, I know why they did, no. 
Don't ever judge motives. Romans 14, 10 says, You then, why do, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we all will stand before God's judgment seat. One day, all of us are going to stand before, God, before God's judgment seat. And the one who truly knows the motives of our heart, he is going to be the one who judges us. And so God says, don't judge. When he says, don't judge, one of the things he's saying is, don't judge broadly. Don't judge motives. Number three, never judge quickly. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and expose the motives of men's heart. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. You know, sometimes we're so quick. We don't have all the information. You know, we're just quick on it. And we make a judgment about someone. God says, don't be so quick to judge. We don't know all the circumstances. But God does. And you know what happens? So many times have you ever made a judgment about someone and come to find out later you were so wrong? As you got to know them more, as, as, as you began to see the circumstances of their life, you were like, you know what, man, I, I, I was off. So we need to be very slow when it comes to judgment. Finally, never judge harshly. Again, Luke 6, 38 says, for with the measure you use, it will measure to you. If you judge someone harshly, God says, that's what's going to happen to you. Be merciful. Be gracious. Judge others the way that you would want them to judge you. Wouldn't you want to be judged with grace? Wouldn't you want to be judged with love? Wouldn't you want to be judged with That's how we want to be judged. The Bible says that that's how we have to judge. So that's what Jesus means when he says don't judge. So important. Don't ever take the Bible out of context. Never just take one phrase and say, well, I know what that means. Look at the entirety of Scripture. See what the Bible actually has to say. I think the most important thing to take away from this is judgment, number one, begins with us. We've got to look in the mirror at our own self. The judgment begins in the house of God. And you know what? I think a judgment, if we begin to do that, if we just judge ourselves and then judge within the house of God, I think the world would look at us and say, wow, they've got something that I really do want. They're living a life. They're walking with Jesus. They're, 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 they're Walking a life of righteousness and holiness, and man, I'm attracted to that, and I want that. You know what? I think the way we live our lives would be enough. The people would say, I need to change because I'm not living like that. As it stands right now, you know what the world says about the church? I don't want to be a part of the church. <clears throat> they point out everything I do, but they forget about it. How many of us want to be labeled by our sin? You know, we do that with some people. We'll say, well, that, that person's a, an adulterer. person's a fornicator. That person's a homosexual. Why would we label their sin when we don't even label our own? I don't want anybody walking around and, and, and saying, boy, there goes, and, and, and they name whatever sin I admit. I mean, would you? Man, that's condemnation. We want, to, we, want to, we want to lift people up. We want to give people hope. We want to help people to see that, that God has a better life. We want to welcome people without judgment because this is what we do. Why do we do it? Because that's what Jesus does. And again, am I saying that we're a church 
that's 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 very judgmental that we don't want. No, 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 no. Not at all. Just simply saying we need to guard ourselves because it's very, very easy, very, very easy to you come to church, go to Bible studies, look at other people or not. It's easy to say, look at me. <coughs> become very proud of what we do rather than rejoicing in the one who did it for us, Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all. All to him I sin had left the crimson stain where he washed it. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looked around.